Hi, my name is Bertie the Beaver. Welcome to the Fort St. John North Peace Museum. Today we're going to take you on a quick tour of our exhibits. Are you ready? Let's go! Did you know a hundred years ago dinosaur footprints were found in the Peace River Canyon? Those dinosaurs were millions of years old. In fact, we have some rare footprints here. The footprints are called Irenosaurus persecutus, and they belong to an ancestor of the Tyrannosaurus rex. Only no bones have been found but, uh, belonging to this dinosaur yet. Look how big the footprint is compared to me. Good thing I wasn't around back then. I would have got squashed. The Denizo indigenous people live in this area. They used to make seasonal rounds, traveling as far north as Hay River in the Northwest Territories and over to Charlie Lake or Cecil Lake, following animals or fishing or collecting berries. You can see a lot of the things that they made in this teepee, which is much smaller than the teepees that they actually lived in. There are some really cool things, including this porcupine quill container. It's a good thing I don't have quills. I don't want to be turned into a container. In 1793, explorer Alexander Mackenzie canoed along the Peace River on his way to find a route to the Pacific Ocean. He noted that there were all sorts of animals here and wrote that this would be a great place for a fur trading fort. He even said, there's every reason to believe that there's an abundance of beaver in this area. I thought that was pretty exciting until I found out they were turning beavers into hats. In 1794, we got our first fort in this area, Rocky Mountain Fort, located between Fort St. John and Hudson's Hope on the Peace River. Unfortunately, they got lots of beaver there. Those beaver were skinned and they were sent over to Europe to be turned into hats. At that time, fashion trends favored wide-brimmed felt hats, and those were made from the underlayer of beaver's fur. Trapping continued to be an important part of Fort St. John's history for the next 150 years. Poor beavers and other animals. Behind me, we have a trapper's cabin, and you would have had one of these at the beginning of your trap line. You would have lived out of it, um, stayed warm, because trapping takes place in winter, and cooked your meals here. Welcome to Clark Mackenzie Finch's General Store. What's a general store? Well, it sells everything, dishes, food, lanterns, things for your farm like tools, and even candy! I love candy. I have a sweet tooth. Ooh, look, candy canes, and it's not even Christmas. Anyone up for a sleigh ride? In the 1920s and 1930s, there was a winter sleigh trail from Fort St. John to Fort Nelson. I don't know about you, but it gets really cold up here in the winter. I'm not going to camp out for a month in minus 40 degree weather. In fact, it got so cold that the horses pulling these sleighs had icicles build up in their nostrils and the freighters had to go out and pick those icicles out. Ew. Look at me, I'm riding the horse. In 1944, Margaret and George Murray came up to start our first newspaper, the Alaska Highway News. At that time, the Alaska Highway had just been built and things were just so booming in Fort St. John that you couldn't even get furniture. The furniture truck would come from Edmonton, pull up outside the furniture store, and everybody would buy stuff off the back of the truck before it even made it into the store. So the Murrays had to be a bit creative. They made their own front counter out of three planks of wood and two sawhorses. Bet I could have helped gnaw some trees for that. In 1942, the Americans built a highway to Alaska with help of the Canadian contractors and the Canadian government. They needed to better protect Alaska and the Aleutian Islands from the Japanese during the Second World War. There had been lots of talk about a road and we're really lucky because Fort St. John had an airfield here and that's part of the reason that this route, including us, was chosen. It was really tough work for those American engineers who came up from the southern United States. They'd never even seen snow, can you believe it? And then after the snow melted, well, they were out in the bush, and let me tell you, those mosquitoes are big and they bite. There are so many stories of how bad the mosquitoes were. One story goes that every time the soldiers took a big spoonful of food, before it got to their mouths, it was all covered in mosquitoes. That's disgusting. Even I don't like that many mosquitoes. Unlike most Canadian communities, Fort St. John didn't get a train until 1958. Can you believe it? 
We had lots of trains that would take you into the Alberta part of the Peace Region, including the Edmonton, Dunvegan and British Columbia Railway. It had a nickname, extremely dangerous and badly constructed. I don't think I'd want to ride that railway, would you? Finally, in 1958, the Pacific Great Eastern Railway comes to Fort St. John, but it has a lot of bad nicknames too, from Please Go Easy to Puff, Grunt, and Expire. We had passenger service for a brief four years, and then you had to take a bus to Prince George just to go down to Vancouver. I don't know about you, but it was a lot easier for us to fly. A farming community like Fort St. John needed a blacksmith. Blacksmiths could make all sorts of tools for your farm. They could make horseshoes for your horses. They even made huge metal bands that fit around your wagon wheels. Your wooden wagon wheels could easily get destroyed by potholes in our dirt roads. Or maybe a beaver would gnaw through them. But these metal bands, they help protect those wheels. In 1912, the Peace River Block was open to homesteaders. If you had $10, I bet you have $10, you could get a quarter section, 160 acres. But the catch was the land wasn't quite yours yet. You had to live on your land for at least six months of the year. You had to clear land to farm, and you had to build three buildings. I would have a dam, a lodge, and another dam on mine, but I'd be great at cutting down all those trees for farming. You wouldn't need those saws and axes. I could take care of those for you. This is our 1923 Dodge Brothers Roadster. It's a pretty cool looking car, isn't it? But you wouldn't want to drive it in winter around here. No windows, no heat, no radio. A lot of cars like this got stuck on our rough, dirt, muddy roads. We have tons of pictures in our archives of people who had to get their cars pulled out by nearby farmers and their teams of horses. Could somebody crank the motor, please? I'm ready to drive. Just over a hundred years ago, Taylor and Fort St. John got their first schools. You needed at least eight kids to start a school, and then the BC government would pay for a teacher. What if you didn't have eight kids in your community? Well, you could send somebody who was maybe a little too young as your eighth child, just so you can have those funds to have a teacher. Teaching school was pretty difficult. You had to teach all eight grades. Lots of teachers started, and there weren't even any textbooks. Sometimes the windows hadn't even arrived. And it was really cold in the winter and dark too. Some schools started later because it gets so dark up here in the mornings in the winter. And then of course you had your ink. Pens back in those days didn't have ink inside them, so you had to dip your pen in the ink. Well, when those schools were so cold overnight, the ink started freezing, so you had to put the ink on the stove so it would thaw. But you had to be careful. Don't let it get too warm, or else it might explode! Can you believe it? About a hundred years ago, most houses in Fort St. John did not have hot and cold running water or electricity. In fact, it wasn't until well into the 1940s that a lot of the town got it, and not until the 1950s and 1960s that a lot of our nearby communities got those things. How did you make do? Well, you had a stove for heating and for cooking. And your stove, it operated on either coal or wood. I better have a coal fire stove, otherwise I might eat all the fuel. And then how did you keep your food cold? People went out and cut blocks of ice from your nearby lakes and rivers and stored them in an ice house. And then they cut smaller blocks and lifted them into their ice box, which you can see over there in our kitchen display. Uh, and that acted like your refrigerator. It kept the food underneath all nice and cold. This is a parlor. It's kind of like a living room or a dining room. It's a place to entertain yourselves or to gather as a family after dinner. We have all sorts of games and books in this parlor, a pump organ. And do you see that radio over there? That guy has a pretty cool story. We had a surveyor called Duncan Cran who went around mapping out land and he took that radio with him on horseback. It was battery operated so he could stay in touch with all the news. Does this bedroom look smaller than your bedroom today? Well, rooms back then were often a lot smaller. They were easier to heat, but brr, this house could be cold in the winter. So if you were lucky like these people, you might have a ceramic hot water bottle or a pig 
and they filled those with hot water and they helped keep you warm in bed. Other people would put their pajamas on the stove, warm them up, jump into their pajamas and race up to bed. It was hard to live when it was so cold like that. So some people had chamber pots in their bedroom. So rather than go to your outhouse when it was minus 40 below and snowing in the middle of the night, it was easy to use a chamber pot instead. And a lot of them even had lids to help contain the stink. Ew. Welcome to the Grand Haven Outpost Hospital. This was our first hospital back in 1930. We got our first nurse, Ann Roberts Young, and she delivered 300 to 400 babies throughout her career. She traveled in weather as cold as minus 70 in a sleigh to assist with births, or people could come here to the outpost hospital and have their babies. This coverlet behind me has 99 of the names of the babies that she delivered, where they were born and what date they were born. If I had been on this quilt, then I would have said Birdie Beaver, born in Fish Creek, that's just north of town here, on May 5th, 2018. This dental equipment belonged to our first dentist here in Fort St. John, Dr. Zlogy. He came all the way from Budapest in Hungary and met our second doctor, Dr. Kearney, at a conference, and Dr. Kearney persuaded him to come and be our dentist. The equipment may look a little old, it did go through a fire. He became Fort Nelson's dentist after ours and served our communities for probably over 40 years. Check out my teeth, do you think he'd approve? I'd like my teeth bleached, please. I hope you've enjoyed our tour of the Fort St. John North Peace Museum today. We didn't have time to show you everything, so come on down and check it out. We're open year round, Monday to Saturday.